Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and we're delighted that you have invited you. us into your home. You know, you're an important part of the family, and we would love to hear from you. What you need to do is just send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. Well, Joy, I've just been stuck on our guest uh, for this show, Bob Lujano. He's a motivational speaker. He's a Paralympic athlete. And, you know, we speak about a number of things at the beginning of the segment, but when I was trying to research him and went to his uh, website, um, it said, no arms, no legs, no problems. Mm. <laughs> and I, as soon as I read that, I, mean, I just I couldn't go any further. Of course, I was thinking about my own life and things and so on. Um, no arms, no legs, no problem. And of course, th there are difficulties. It is a problem in a sense, I think. But he's saying it, there must be something greater there. And he's an overcomer. And he's filled with the joy of the Lord and, mm -hmm. and evangelization. And I just think it speaks to everyone, this overcoming spirit, this greater something that comes out of uh, difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I guess that's what I heard as soon as I read, no arms, no legs, no problem. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That must be a part of his life. He's going to tell a story. I'm not going to tell a story. You're going to meet him. You're going to encounter Bob Lujano, and it's going to be fantastic. But this is true for all of us, and he's mm -hmm. just uh, a, a big example of that, of trust in God and overcoming and the true sacredness and dignity of a person. But... I really am hoping and praying that all of us will get, you know, his, his life and his story because so many of you um, are facing things in your life, getting very difficult diagnosis, um, life-threatening illnesses. The loss of a spouse. Infidelity, the loss of, the loss of children. I mean, you send us all of these <laughs> emails. We all know our stories or uh, whatever it might be. And somehow, may the Holy Spirit come to you. Maybe it's just... Aging, you know, I, I like to speak to people in their 90s sometimes and they just said, I never thought I'd be 90 and how do you do 93, mm -hmm. 4, 5, 6, 7 and, you know, you can do all things through Jesus Christ who's going to strengthen you and that's, that's what I'm getting in the show today. And the beautiful thing that you'll hear in Bob's story is, um, you know, sometimes in life, um, it doesn't seem fair. Life just isn't fair. Like, th why is this happening to me? Mm. And, um, but it, we respond. And, y you know, they're not sayings where, oh, this is going to make you better or bitter. And those are ways that we can respond. But Bob, for some reason, chose to not only uh, survive an illness, but he's thriving. And he's made a life choice. Um, he's a young man to uh, just thrive and to say, this isn't the end of the story. You know, I can remember getting a cancer diagnosis and, and having, when, I, when my mind got cleared of everything, I said, hon, what did they say? And, you know, and you sat me down and you told me yeah. what they said and everything. Yeah. And my, one of my responses was, well, wait a minute, hon. We don't listen to anything they say anyway <laughs> about who we are. And what does God say? Is this cancer unto my death? Is this heart attack unto your death, the heart <clears throat> attack that you had? What is it about? God, are you in this? And what do you say? And even if it is, like we'll share with Bob his story, um, how he had to lose arms and legs, no arms, no legs, yeah. no problems. <laughs> uh, what, what makes a human being respond in, um, and not curse God and to say, okay, this is it, and, and go on and make the best of life in that response. Well, Bob Lujano is up next, motivational speaker, Paralympic athlete, incredible human being. I really believe you're going to encounter Jesus Christ in his face and in this life. May it be a great encouragement to you this day. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. You're at home with Jim and Joy. Please don't go away.
Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and today we have a wonderful young man with us. His name is Bob Luhana. Now, he is a motivational speaker. He's a Paralympic athlete, and he's authored a book called No Arms, No Legs, No Problems. Rather amazing. So, Bob, we want to welcome you to At Home with Jim and Joy, and we're delighted that you're here. And we've seen you around in the Birmingham area. You yeah. showed up at some of our banquets and um, for Her Choice Birmingham Women's Center. But today, um, and we've seen you at marches, so you're pretty active. You get out and about. We want you to tell your life story, how you came to be in the situation that you are right now. Oh, it's my honor to be here as well, so thank you. Uh, I was living in Kansas at the time. My parents had divorced, and my dad got custody, but he couldn't take care of us and work because we were still very young, me and my sister, my older sister, Lisa. So they moved us to Kansas um, where his mother, uh, my grandmother, Hope, uh, raised us. And um, it was there that I very much got to embrace our Catholic faith because uh, my grandmother, Hope, was very much devout Catholic, uh, prayed the rosary in the morning and the last thing at night. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was also very much uh, telling us, well, you know, we're going to go to, to Mass, but, you know, you're not just going to do 60 minutes and then go home. You know, you're going to be part of uh, the CCD class. You're also going to be a lector, and, uh, an altar boy, excuse me. Mm -hmm. first, you're going to be an altar boy. And then uh, as I grew, uh, being involved in the church, I, you know, just continued on and became a lector. And, and now I'm actually a Eucharistic minister at, at Prince of Peace Catholic mm -hmm. Church. Uh, but, you know, it was at that time that I very much got to embrace our Catholic faith. Um, on January 7, 1979, I contracted a, a rare form of meningitis uh, called meningococcosemia. Mm -hmm. And basically what happened is that the illness entered my bloodstream and it prevented blood circulation. Um, you know, if you have a bruise, that's an area where there was no blood circulation. Well, my whole body was a bruise and it was eventually getting mm -hmm. to my heart. And as the doctor said to me, you know, you're going to die. You know, there's nothing we can do for you. Mm -hmm. uh, we said last rites, had a priest come in, got to say goodbye to the family. And... Uh, Went to sleep and uh, wasn't supposed to wake up. You were how old? Nine years Nine. old. Yeah. Yeah. But I woke up, you know, and that was the blessing of it. Uh, and even though I didn't have my legs, and then a month later I'd lose my hands uh, and go through many blood transfusions and operations, I was alive. And I knew at that time, even though as young as I was, that uh, that really affirmed, you know, my faith in God. That He wanted me alive for a reason. Right. Not sure the reason. I uh, definitely prayed uh, about, you know, just wanting to play with my, my cousins and just wanted to you know, go back to school, uh, you know, what sports was I going to play? Mm -hmm. You know, these are things that were in my mind. Yeah. Didn't worry too much about them, just, just prayed about them. Uh, and the Lord provides, as He always does. And, uh, you know, He first provided with a family. Uh, my family has been just instrumental, uh, my immediate family and my external family. Uh, you know, my dad was very instrumental in me helping to deal with uh, disability. Uh, probably the most difficult part of being having a disability is the mental aspect. Yeah. You know, I look different. That's not mm -hmm. going to change. Mm -hmm. Um, so one time whenever people, a person might have been laughing or pointing or staring, he had a way of just being able to make it funny or, mm -hmm. or make it a joke and mm -hmm. made the situation light. Uh, he never, I never felt from him that he was embarrassed to have a child with a disability. Mm -hmm. And once mm -hmm. I saw that from him, then there was no reason for me to be ashamed or, or insecure about who I am. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was all pretty much, uh, you know, downhill as far as, you know, realizing there was a lot of things ahead of me. There's a lot of uh, operations. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, once I got out of the hospital after six months, I went up to uh, Rehabilitation, <clears throat> excuse me, the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, up in Chicago, Illinois. And I was about to begin a nine-month rehab stint. And it was at that time that we got a message that uh, Pope John Paul II was going to be uh, in Chicago. It was mm -hmm. his second stop of his, of his world tour. And we just so happened to be there and get tickets and... Uh, uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, we were there at the side of the cathedral, at All Saints uh, Cathedral. Uh, he comes out of the cathedral after giving a service, and um, it was at night, and he just kind of really lit up the whole area. Uh, mm -hmm. he just, you could just see um, the, the, you know, the presence of the Lord with him. Uh, I don't know how to explain it other yeah. than that. Uh, and then he comes down the platform, because they had put me uh, at the edge of a platform. Uh, the police uh, were there helping. Uh, my good friend Jim Zewitt uh, was there helping. And he comes down the platform and he looks right at me and, and gives me uh, a blessing in, in, uh, in Latin, mm -hmm. uh, I guess the official uh, liturgical blessing. And uh, he also provided me with a rosary, uh, which he, he mm -hmm. blessed as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that moment, again, just kind of affirmed that uh, the Lord is with me and right. I was going to begin yeah. my rehab stint away from family. 
uh, away from friends and, um, and you know th that really gave me the motivation to continue mm -hmm. to to get through this and, and to to get through the rehab and and move on with my life and um, you know after coming back from rehab uh, it was time to get back into school and probably the most difficult part of going back to school was PE class mm -hmm. uh, I was literally kind of told to sit off here at the side and mm -hmm. you know uh, you know just sit here <laughs> and play checkers and watch everyone else play, have fun mm -hmm. and, yeah. mm -hmm. you know and after a couple of months it was like well you know uh, I'm, I'm done playing checkers you know give mm -hmm. me the football and let's just throw the football around all right uh, all right now you guard him and you run around and mm -hmm. you rush the passer and you know, I had seven-on-seven seven touch football going on. Mm -hmm. um, it was then that the uh, coaches there said, well, you know, let's get him in to do some of the PE things that we're doing. And I just found a way to adapt whatever yes. sport was going on so I could yeah. participate. And, mm -hmm. and actually, that's actually illegal right now to not, uh, because of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act, it prevents uh, from anyone from discriminating in a public school. So a person that may have a disability, a physical disability, um, for them to be excluded um, right. is actually against the law. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of some of the things I... I that I work on today, and I'll talk about that later. Um, probably the most interesting part after uh, I got through that with PE was, you know, graduating. Uh, I graduated high school. Uh, it was a very, I guess, emotional moment, just uh, being able to endure everything and, and to go on to school. Mm -hmm. uh, I then went on to uh, at University of Texas at Arlington was my mm -hmm. first uh, school, um, and it was there that um, I had my first structured activity for a person with a physical disability. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get it in public school. It was here at the University of Texas at Arlington. They had a wheelchair basketball team, mm -hmm. and that was the first time I had seen wheelchair basketball. Uh, I wasn't on the team, but I actually got to participate and, and practice with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that group of guys very much, uh, you know, that were on that team were very much, you know, the leaders of that school, uh, mm -hmm. and people came to the wheelchair basketball games, and. Uh, and even now at University of Texas at Arlington, there's a wheelchair basketball program that mm -hmm. goes on. Um, after that experience, I then went on to school at University of Tennessee, and I studied uh, sport management and recreation. Uh, it was there, after graduating, I went on to Atlanta, Georgia, and worked for the 96 Paralympic uh, Olympic Games. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember that, the mm -hmm. 96 Paralympic Games. Yes. And uh, it was Greece? there that I, I'm sorry? In Greece? No, in the 96 Atlanta. Paralympic Games oh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. So I was working there. Mm -hmm. And it was there that I very much was introduced to the sport of wheelchair rugby. Mm -hmm. uh, wheelchair rugby is a full wheelchair contact sport. Uh, we literally hit each other so right. hard that we knocked that's each a, other. That's a lot of uh, contact. Yes, and, and that's the object of the sport. It, it's played on a basketball Gosh. court. You have 10 seconds to inbound, 12 seconds across midcourt. And you get to the other end of the court uh, by crossing to the goal with the ball. Uh, you have to bounce the ball and pass to a teammate once every 10 mm -hmm. seconds. And the other team stops you by slamming into you. Yeah. Uh, if you get a turnover uh, and score, you know, you're probably going to win the game. It's, it's a matter of just getting turnovers and scoring. Uh, but so it's, it's very got, fast. So you're in the wheelchair. We're in the rugby Are chair. Are you strapped yeah. in the wheelchair? Yes, I'm strapped okay. in. Most helmet? Most no, we don't use no hel helmets. You don't no use helmets. helmets. No. And they're crashing. You're crashing into each other. Yeah. Do the wheel wheelchair is pretty stable? Do you go down and? Okay. Well, if you get hit at the right spot, yeah, you can get knocked over. Um, you can't hit anybody from behind. That's illegal. But mm -hmm. if you hit them real hard on the side or the front, mm -hmm. most of the guys that play, most of the men and women that play wheelchair rugby, uh, have spinal cord injuries, so mm -hmm. their balance is impaired. Mm -hmm. So that could be as they're trying to throw the ball or they're pushing too fast. You can hit them and, and knock them over. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very fast, very physical. Uh, the United States Quad Rugby Association, uh, USQRA.org. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find more information about uh, wheelchair rugby and being involved. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, being a part of that sport, and for the last 20 years I've played wheelchair rugby, it very much has given me the opportunity to have an independent life, uh, be, have a competitive sport mm -hmm. opportunity. And it actually allowed me to go to the Paralympic Games in, in mm -hmm. Athens, Greece, That's 2004. Right. I was yeah. selected. And it was there that we won the bronze medal. Mm -hmm. uh, but being on the U.S. team, and I was there from 98 to 2006, it's the most difficult thing I ever had to go through. Mm -hmm. um, they don't give you a spot on the team just because um, right. you have a disability right. uh, or because you're you good looking. You have to earn it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, you have to earn it. And mm -hmm. uh, there's drills you have to participate in. Um, you even had to sign code of conduct saying you're not going to get in trouble with the law or, or mm -hmm. find illicit pictures on the Internet. Uh, so it's very much, you know, it should be a very much high calling, if you will. Um, so I very much embraced uh, that opportunity. I didn't want to be that person that was kicked off the team because of right. uh, you know, improper conduct mm -hmm. and things of that nature. So um, at the end of the day, it was a very rewarding experience. Um, we did mm -hmm. win the bronze medal. We wanted to win the gold, but the bronze mm -hmm. medal uh, was mm -hmm. what we got. And you can find a lot of this captured in the movie uh, Murderball, the documentary. The uh, Murderball, it was nominated for Academy Award. Mm -hmm. um, and again, at the end of the day, it was very much captured our struggle uh, as a U.S. rugby team to get to that, uh, that bronze medal game. Um, 
after that, I then uh, found a job here at Lakeshore Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lakeshore Foundation has been around for over 20 years, and we provide recreation opportunities to people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And as I was hired on in 98, I was a recreation specialist working with kids and youth, mm -hmm. and basically teaching them how to play recreational activities. A lot of the things that I did when I was in high school to adapt sports mm -hmm. is kind of the same things that I was teaching them. Um, so at the end of the day, you can almost say that it was because of my disability, it was allowed me to have the job that I have because uh, mm -hmm. it very right. much was a benefit to mm -hmm. be able to teach people, mm -hmm. uh, young people, the experiences I went through and how to live independently, how to pick things off the floor, how to open the door and, and get through it with your wheelchair. Mm -hmm. You know, these are things that people need to know, kids need to know. Right. Um, so after being here at Lakeshore for 13 years and, and, and serving our youth with disabilities, our seniors with disabilities, our military with disabilities, um, you know, it, it's just a rewarding experience to know that Lakeshore Foundation, which is an official Olympic and Paralympic training site, is very much designated to serving people with disabilities. And, and if you go to lakeshore.org, uh, you can find out all the ways that mm -hmm. you can get involved to, to very much look to serve our troops and, and serve our members. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's an outstanding uh, experience being a part of Lakeshore Foundation and right now over the last four years I've been with the National Center on Health, Physical mm -hmm. Activity and Disability mm -hmm. which is located at Lakeshore Foundation and our mission there is to very much promote um, what I call I guess disability agenda uh, promoting uh, inclusion uh, you know if you ever go into a building and, and you know there's accessible mm -hmm. parking and, right. and if you go up to a door you can push a button and it opens right. up you know these actually benefit everyone everyone uh, so mm -hmm. at the end of the day to have you know accessible entrances and have uh, accessible restrooms and things mm -hmm. of that nature it mm -hmm. makes it very much an inclusive society you know mm -hmm. look at your own neighborhood uh, you know see if you have curb cuts right. or, or, or uh, sidewalk ramps mm -hmm. in your neighborhood if you have that then you'll probably see people with disabilities that have used mobility devices that can walk around mm -hmm. and be a part uh, of their community and these are things that I you know, very much look to promote, uh, that we at, at NICPAD look to promote. And um, I recently, uh, a couple years ago, went to D.C. and actually got to speak to the First Lady and, mm -hmm. and tell her the importance of inclusion in her program called Let's Move. Mm -hmm. And we also kicked off a, a Commit to Inclusion. Uh, you can go to committoinclusion.org. And uh, there's very ways for a community to get involved, for coalitions to form, to make sure that there are inclusive facilities, right. inclusive neighborhoods. So, um, and you know, just I would mentioned about a neighborhood you know, if there's ramps in a neighborhood, you can see people that may be pushing in their neighborhood. Uh, we started a campaign called um, How I Walk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way you walk is going to be different for me. Right. But as long as I'm out there pushing mm -hmm. around and going around my neighborhood, then I can very much lead, uh, you know, a healthy, active lifestyle in my neighborhood. So, um, you know, these are just things that at NICPAD we get to be involved in to very much promote, uh, when I say the disability agenda, mm -hmm. you know, something like uh, person first language, uh, you know, in years we had derogative terms for people with disabilities. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I'm a person with a disability, and, mm -hmm. and I'm content with that because I am a person first. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the end of the day, these are just things that we look to promote. Um, so very much the last 18 years that I've been here, it's very much been a blessing. Uh, you know, those prayers I had when I lost my limbs. You know, for what what job I was going to have, what purpose does a person right. with a disability have? Right. You know, the Lord provided that, and mm -hmm. He's provided it every day when I go to work at Lakeshore Foundation, mm -hmm. being a part of a uh, wheelchair rugby team, mm -hmm. uh, and, and very much be a, a person with a disability living a healthy, active lifestyle. Bob, you're not excited about your life, are you, <laughs> what you do? We're going to take a break at this <clears throat> point, and we're going to have more with Bob Lujano, and uh, he's going to be sharing with us just his, his life, his zeal for life, and he's an overcomer, and we hope that you'll be greatly encouraged by his witness and by his testimony. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. Thank you. Welcome back where well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and we're having a beautiful conversation with our friend Bob Lujana, and he's talking about, he's written a book called No Arms, No Legs, No Problems. Well, right now we're going to go straight to an email. It says, I have a favorite Bible verse of mine, and it's Proverbs 3, verse 5, where it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. 
when our ways are not God's ways, it's hard not to, it's hard to lean not on your own understanding. How can we trust more in God's plan in our life? And this is from Vincent. Well, I think struggle and, and suffering is, is part of our lives too. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to, you know, to get down on the dumps and to do the why me. And, mm -hmm. and, and those are human emotions and there's nothing wrong experiencing right. those. But it, to me, it's at that moment that, that God is there, mm -hmm. you know, that, that Christ is present, that he's reaching out to you, that it's like, all right, I'm here. And you know, that's really what has sustained me is right. just knowing that this just didn't happen for a reason. This right. wasn't uh, because you know things were done bad in the past or, or what have you. It was very much a, a way to show me as an opportunity to reach out for him mm -hmm. uh, and to really very much affirm the faith that I've always known and have and to continue it, mm -hmm. uh, to realize that uh, you know, it doesn't matter how difficult things are, he does provide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, the prayers might not be answered right now, right. but there's a greater purpose, there's a greater direction uh, and really what that verse is really hits on is just, yeah, you, you're praying for, for strength and faith and, and, and patience right now, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, those things really just right. don't happen. And right. in, in regards to myself and in, in regards to all the, the suffering, you know, I very much embraced it and very much was, was thankful for it because I knew there was a, a direction, there was a purpose. Um, and, and, you know, I went over, had over 20 operations and, you know, at the end of the day, I survived all of them. And wow. to me, it was a reflection of, of mm -hmm. his love and his continuing, I guess, faith in me, if you will, mm -hmm. and knowing that there was a purpose. And, and you know, when you're nine or 10 years old going through surgeries, you know, you just want to yeah. get over them and go home and play mm -hmm. you know, with your cousins mm -hmm. and brothers and, and nephews. And, you know, at the end of the day, I just knew that uh, as I got through them, that it was taking me to a step to another direction, to somewhere mm -hmm. else. Um, you know, my life has very much been going in, in different places and, and meeting different people. And one place that really got my uh, strength was going up to Coleman to, to meet uh, mm -hmm. Mother Angelica. Mm -hmm. It was very much in 2002 um, uh, where me and my uncle Richard, uh, he came to visit me from Kansas and he just wanted to, to go mm -hmm. to uh, just to go see the Shrine of the Blessed yeah. Sacrament. And he just wanted to go. And when we were there, uh, as, as we were giving a tour, you know, we just asked, you know, is there any chance to, to mm -hmm. see Mother's mother in? And, I, you know, some of her um, sisters were there and they went out and they grabbed her and brought her in. Mm -hmm. And it was literally right after she had gone through some serious health issues. She had just come home from the hospital. And as I looked at her and talked with her, and, and even though she couldn't talk at the time, I could still see in her eyes the strength yeah. mm -hmm. to know that, mm -hmm. hey, you know, I went through this, but, you know, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And I still am going to be a part of, you know, the Blessed Sacrament. I'm still going to be part of the, the church community. And seeing that strength in her, in her eyes, and, mm -hmm. and knowing what she's yeah. going through, uh, you know, that very much made me realize, you know, I'm in the right place, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being able to meet her, again, was just more affirmation of, of having faith and, and knowing that the Lord is going to provide and take you places you've never been. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I recently, about a year ago, went to Israel mm -hmm. and I presented uh, my book at a conference. And as afterwards, we went uh, to Jerusalem mm -hmm. and uh, went to... Um, <laughs> you know, to the Wailing Wall and, and, mm. and uh, you know, if you read those psalms at the wall. They're, they're very powerful, especially the ones on, on Jerusalem. Um, and then going to the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament, the, mm -hmm. to me the most holy yeah. place mm -hmm. for all Christians, mm -hmm. the most holy place where, where Christ uh, died. And just uh, seeing the tomb um, and, and just being there, I actually had to climb up the stairs to get to the tomb. Mm -hmm. uh, people were wondering, how are you going to get up there? And I just got out of my chair and hopped up. Mm -hmm. um, so again, just having those experiences, meeting the people there. Uh, and I'm actually going to go to Russia uh, on May the 16th, excuse mm -hmm. me, May the 21st to June the 1st. And I'll be there bringing wheelchair rugby uh, to people uh, there in Moscow, mm -hmm. people that have disabilities. Do they not have that there? They do have it. I think they want just a United States perspective. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm don't, going don't, over. don't teach them too well. <laughs> they may def defeat us. At well, at the end rugby. of the day, yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, it's really just about you know okay. serving people with disabilities and having that and opportunity. That, that's the bridge, isn't it? I yeah. mean, because I mean the political system, um, the people. You know, we really can't trust. I mean, not the individual, but the government. They don't trust us, and so some people say, "Well, why are you going over there?" Yeah, there's common things that we have, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the love for sports, uh, you know, maybe I think at the end of the day, I guess going over there and the State Department has asked us to go over there. Uh, there are people over there that are wanting this. They're wanting things that we have here in the States mm -hmm. and wheelchair rugby is one of them uh, in regards to serving people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have people with disabilities in, in Moscow as well and they're looking for them to be healthy, active people and mm -hmm. this is definitely one way to do that. So. Well, Bob, when, when was during this whole beautiful journey that you're on, when do you think was the most like difficult time of it? 
you know, you had all those surgeries and everything, but but you just emotionally, being a young guy, and you know, how did, how did it affect you? It was probably the most difficult part uh, as a teenager, uh, where we all struggle, mm -hmm. our identity, who we are, the physical changes you go through. Uh, and for me, you know, I was probably no different than the other teen. Where was I going to go? What was I going to do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I loved my, my family, my, my mom and dad, and my upbringing. But I just knew that uh, there was a, somewhere I was supposed to be. Uh, I actually left home when I was 19. Um, but, you know, I just knew that uh, it wasn't going to end, uh, you know, through tragic ways. I, I, I was going to endure this. I was going mm -hmm. to move forward. I wasn't going to let it bring me down. I, I just viewed it as another opportunity for me to reach for God because he was reaching for me. You know, that's, you know, during the struggles is when he is reaching for you mm -hmm. because it is real easy to say, well, no, I'm, I'm not going to follow you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I went to church more. I prayed more. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I did things that I, I knew that I had to do just to get through those moments. Um, and again, it was support from my family, uh, the love and support from them and even our community, um, you know, very much just reaching out and, and knowing that I'm a person that uh, wanted to be no different than anyone mm -hmm. else, wanted an educational you opportunity. You were sharing, you know, in terms of the difficulty, especially in your teenage years, and I think you said, you know, you decided you're going to persevere and work your faith. You didn't want to do something that could no. be tragic. Are you speaking there or referring to taking your own life, suicide? Not that you were thinking about that, but that's, that's, and now we have our society, you know, back when you were going through what you're going through, it's, uh, there's groups that would encourage and say, mm -hmm. it's your right to do that. We'll help you to do this. And mm -hmm. what would you, how do you speak to that? Because that, that's, that's a, a growing insidious evil. Yes, no doubt about it. You know, we need to promote life. We need to realize that all lives are valuable and, and sacred. And even if you have a disability, but, you know, especially in our teens, when we are, you know, inundated with, with pornography and things of that nature, you know, it's very much important to realize that these are the struggles that we go through to prove that we do belong with the Lord, that we do love him, that we do believe that he exists. And, you know, I, I, I didn't want to go down that route that would turn that away, that, that would yeah. deprive me of those opportunities to having a life that he is calling me to. Um, you know, the things that, that bring us down are, are things that, you know, that easily tempt us. And we think that it's, you know, a satisfying way. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that you're just missing greater glory. Mm -hmm. You're missing the, the purpose that he specifically has for your life. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, for me, going through those struggles and, and knowing that having the support of my family, there was no reason for me for it to end in a tragic way. Mm -hmm. There was no reason for me to go down, you know, uh, yeah. through drugs or, or through alcohol abuse mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Okay. Um, you know, that I've had people in my family uh, as an example to, that went through that and knowing that uh, you can survive, knowing that you can overcome, knowing that the Lord is with you, uh, but yet seeing all the struggles that, that they had to go through, I, I just didn't want to go through that way. Mm -hmm. Tell you obviously speak to groups of, of people and they're not all people with disabilities, so you speak speaking with young people, yes. especially the teenage years. And, and, and some of them have real genuine struggles in the midst of this culture. Some of them are really in fine homes and everything's okay. And it's just like, if I have a bad hair day, it's like yeah. the bad worst thing in my life where I don't know if I want to play football because I have to put a helmet on and mess up my hair. <laughs> uh, do you speak to young people like this? And, and how, how do they react to you? Or, or have you followed along with any? Have any continued a conversation with you where you kind of break through all this and say, you know, the essence of your being is what it's about, you know? Uh, what do yeah, you well, the most important message I can give to you, and I usually speak at Our Lady of Sorrows or, or Prince of Peace in Hoover and uh, to the youth there. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, it, it is about serving the church. So I know through my teenage years, it, it was, I remember Dad many times knocking on the door, let's go, we're going to, going to Mass, it's, it's, it's 8 in the morning, and, you know, you kind of want to sleep in. But, mm -hmm. you know, it was, again, realizing that we're supposed to serve the church. We're supposed to serve each other. Uh, it's not about me. It's not about how well I look and how beautiful I am. It's about very much serving our community, serving people with disabilities, serving people in the church. You know, when you go to CCD, when you go to be an altar server, when you're an elector, you, that's your way of serving the church. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I know we have youth uh, groups uh, at OLS and, and, and Prince of Peace and, and all our Catholic dioceses. And, you know, that's what that opportunity is. That's that opportunity of uh, affirming your faith and, and, mm -hmm. and believing that, yes, God exists and I'm here to serve people and this is the way I'm going to do it. And, right. yeah. uh, you, know. you know, Pope Francis, when they had this gathering of, of young people and seniors that all came together, and at some point in his address, I, and he talked about so many teenagers that are really uh, depressed and yeah. in despair. And, and he just simply said, you know, if you want to, and it's not the total answer, but you know, if you want to get out all of that, you know, just go visit 
the, the seniors in nursing homes. Yes, you know, just exactly. like, like mm -hmm. it's like do something, which a lot of people say, but that's trite. How can you say that these people are really, these, it's your call, like serve the church, right. serve other people, mm -hmm. give your life away. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm currently a, a Eucharistic minister, <clears throat> excuse me, a Eucharistic minister at Prince of Peace. And, uh, you know, the reason why, the reason I go uh, to the senior citizens uh, and I go to River Chase um, to bring communion, the reason I do that is, is one, because I feel God has called me to it, but also uh, my grandmother, uh, Hope, she's in a, uh, a home right now. Mm -hmm. And I know, um, you know, this is kind of seeing the seniors there and talking with them. It just makes me think of her and, and yeah. all that she went through yeah. for me. And then also just knowing one of these days we're going to be seniors. And right. I would really love it if someone would bring me communion. Sure. Uh, you know, like that scripture verse says, you know, do unto others. Right. So no doubt uh, I'm hoping if I live to be a senior that someone will bring so you, communion. You're actually me. going to hospitals and yeah. bringing nursing homes. Nursing homes. What's the exactly. response when you come in with people who don't know you? I mean, is it just like what? It's like, um, just like for anybody else, it's the same response or is well, it a little I'm, take back or like what's happening? Well, I'm with a group that goes okay. through, so I'm not this week, I'm yeah. next week. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I think the people gravitate to the, each person that comes and the yeah. stories they have and just to be able to interact. And basically there's someone there to talk to, yeah. to talk to about, oh, you know, what's going on here, or what my family's going through. So, mm -hmm. you know, no doubt uh, that's that's something, just giving of yourself and of your time that, that where I'm called to do and that it's we're beautiful. called to do. Well, and I, I think I think the greatest gift you bring is yourself. You might not have arms and legs, but you bring your heart. You bring mm -hmm. your spirit. You know, and, and, and you want to connect and encounter another human spirit and another <laughs> human heart. Um, and that is so beautiful, you know, and for teenagers and stuff, you just, you know, they're just so self-absorbed and it's all about how they look and how they feel just in that moment. And it's almost like your beautiful book and your beautiful life story, it's, kind of, it's like snap out of it already. It's like, <laughs> what's the matter with you? But you know, the you other know? point is, and maybe this is, this is where you gotta help us understand, sure. <laughs> maybe right here you know, on the show, um, is that he does bring his disabilities. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not only that, you know, and, and that's, you are bringing that, and that's really powerful. Uh, I mean, the essence of your being is the key thing, it is the arms and legs look, but, but you know, what you bring and what you have, what you don't have, how you do and what you're doing, is all the big impact. And I think yeah. a lot of people see themselves in you. Because yeah. my, my thing might not be the arms and the leg things. I've got other things that are like disabilities in my life, you know, and it's kind of exactly. like, wow, I can relate. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, it's it's up to me as a person with a disability and maybe all people with disabilities, and, and I know all people with disabilities may not feel this way, but it's, it's up to me to make myself approachable to you. It's up okay. to me to, uh, you know, stick my hand out to shake your hand. Mm -hmm. It's up to me mm -hmm. to, you know, very much whenever that child is, is, is pointing and staring to go up and ask them, you know, are there any questions you want to ask? Because, you know, right. that's a way of encountering people. That's a way of, of, of sharing yourself. Uh, that's a way of, of stripping yourself down, if you will, as far as just you know, not being, you know, ashamed or, or being, uh, you know, insecure. You know, it's about just opening yourself yeah. up to people. And, uh, you know, I have no problem talking about my disability and, and uh, and do, I very you, much look for those moments. Do you, yeah. this is so important, and we had a little bit of a conversation about this beforehand, because I've seen you around town and so on, and I didn't know who you are, and you've come to Bangladesh. So, and like in the back, I just said, well, how do I shake your hand? You know what <laughs> I mean? Because mm -hmm. I've seen you other times, I just put my hand on your shoulder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you did say, you know, it's, I feel like it's up to me to help you. Right. How do I right. shake your hand? Well, I put my hand out, and you, you shake yeah. What's here? And we hugged. Oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but do you, do you share that with people that you're working with, or no, you don't yeah. go there in terms of make your, you know, help these people to know, you exactly. know that, that you're who you are and what you can and can't do? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I wholeheartedly take that, uh, you know, that position that it's up to me to, to, to make right. myself approachable, mm -hmm. to talk to people. Because, you know, you, you could see that young person just kind of looking, looking and turning yeah. away, and sometimes yeah. a parent will come in, oh, don't look, don't look. And, right. you know, it's up to me to really what's you know, close my, that bridge. What's my responsibility? What's our responsibility in, in responding to someone with your disabilities? Well, yeah, just, uh, I, I think at the end of the day, it's just, you know, saying hello back and, right. and talking and, and engaging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very much, I like, again, I, I like having questions asked because I know it's in your mind and I have no issue with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the things that maybe as far as like disability etiquette, you know, right. people that has wheelchairs, sometimes in the past, there's, you've seen uh, handles mm -hmm. and sometimes a person may come up and, and push you. Yeah, and, give you a push. And, and that's very disrespectful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's okay. something to where it's up to me to ask you, right. I need help. There's nothing wrong with offering. No, right. there's no one, But when you come up and actually put your hands, right. that's when you're usurping the independence of the right. person with a disability. 
you know, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. We all should help each other, and there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Right. Uh, but, you know, it, you know, you don't know if I can get the box on top of the aisle at the grocery mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I can get it. But right. it's a, and there's nothing wrong with you asking. Right. But it's also up to me, because I know I can't get it. Right. Can you, can you help say, me grab can this? can you help me? Exactly. So, so have, but don't be afraid to have the conversation. Exactly. Don't be afraid to have a conversation. But you know, Bob, you know, we sat in the green parlor. Well, first of all, you wrote your uh, answers out, right? And yes. so we were, we were like, who wrote this? It was like, <laughs> he, said, he wrote it. He said, I, wrote I it. did. This is how I, I knew. Like, how is he writing, right? You <laughs> wrote and you brushed your own hair and you fed yourself back there and you were drinking back there. I was answering and, a lot of questions. And you were I? answering questions. And, <laughs> okay, but you drive. Yes. How do you drive? Driving is, is pretty easy. There's a brake and a gas. <laughs> <laughs> the the brake and the gas are connected to a bar and you just push down uh, to accelerate and push forward to brake. And, you know, I, no different than any other teen. I had to go through. But who taught you head. to drive? Uh, I was in Texas, Texas Department of Human Services. They have uh, hand controls uh, mm -hmm. for people with disabilities to mm -hmm. be able to drive a car. So. And you had to pass the test. Yes, I had to pass the test. Right, like just like else. everybody else. The, the, well, the, thank yeah. God. Exactly. Well, we're going to go straight to an email. It says, as someone who has dealt with all kinds of suffering throughout my life, I would like to offer some comfort for others who are watching. God is with you, even if you can't see him, hear him, or feel him. He is with you and wants you to cling to him. So cling to him and don't let go. The struggles we face are all for his glory. So take up your cross and know that you are not alone. And that's a beautiful message from Esther. Oh, well, thank you, Esther. I also think just to give thanks. I mean, I, I know it's so difficult when you're going through bad news or, mm -hmm. or suffering or struggling, but give thanks because, you know, I think that is the Lord reaching to you. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with giving thanks. You know, you're going to give thanks if he gives you a million dollars or mm -hmm. someone gives you a brand new car, right. you know, no doubt you're going to say hallelujah. But it's real difficult to find thanks in the struggling and the suffering, but you have to because, again, he, he wants to be part of every part of your life, mm -hmm. including the suffering, probably especially the suffering. Mm -hmm. So feel free to give thanks, give praise. Um, it, it may sound kind of unconventional, but I, I think that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. so. I'm sure you've met people uh, who are really struggling, uh, maybe physical disabilities or whatever, and I think it's important to say, you know, God, God can take it when we're not praising Him. Yes. You know, or, no. or you're saying, like, why, and it's, yeah. it's negative, or... You don't want to curse God. You don't want to make it a habit. But he can even take that oh, yeah. if you do that, right? I mean, yeah. that's so important to, to, but, to let people know God's still committed to you. you yeah, know? and I think at the end of the day, you have to be yourself because that's how he created you to be. And, you know, it's through the struggling that he's reaching out to you. And, and, and it'll change you in the way you respond to him. Uh, you know, it, it could be derogative. It could be, you know, pleasant. But at the end of the day, you got to be who you are because mm -hmm. that's how he created you. And this is a way that he's reaching out to you. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with saying thanks. Well, tell us about so. this medal. Sure. Well, that was the silver medal uh, that we won at the World Championship in, in Sweden. Um, it was, again, we were supposed to finish with gold, but I'm happy with silver. Uh, the box was created by my Aunt Mary Navarro that uh, lives in Newton, Kansas. But uh, so very much, uh, this is what I usually take around when I give speeches and mm -hmm. lectures. But, uh, but yes, this was made in, uh, in Sweden. In what kind Sweden. of moment was that for you in life? Oh, well, um, <laughs> well, it's featured in the documentary Murderball, and mm -hmm. actually we were all pretty sad because <laughs> mm -hmm. we were supposed to win the gold, but we mm -hmm. won the silver. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, you know, I always look at this um, as, as a joyful moment because I, I worked very hard. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I think I wore my silver medal. There's usually a reception afterwards, and I wore it, and I don't think anyone else did on the yeah. U.S. team. But I wore mine because I, I, I worked hard to get there, yeah. and it was a way of just saying, Yes, I know it's not gold, but I'm very happy with the effort. Uh, yes. Um, yes, we wanted gold, but we, this is what you got. And mm -hmm. At the Paralympic level, you, you earn what you get. You know, mm -hmm. there's nothing given to you. So if you won a silver medal, you win a silver medal. If you win a bronze, you win a bronze. You win a gold, you win a gold. But uh, I was very thankful for that and, uh, you know, very much embraced that moment. So, mm -hmm. what, what do you feel your, your life message is to people? That no matter how difficult life is, no matter how much struggle you go through, how much suffering you go through, give thanks to God mm -hmm. and, and know that this is his time that he's reaching for you um, and, and take that suffering and, and, and give thanks. And, and yeah, there's nothing wrong with, with praying for a cure and, and to be healed. Those are beautiful things to pray mm -hmm. for. But uh, just use that time through your suffering uh, to find joy mm -hmm. because it, it's really easy to get depressed and right. think life's over. But give thanks to what you have and what you've been through. 
Bob, thank you just for being who you are. You are a tremendous blessing. May the best be yet to come in your life. And I know that you've inspired so many people throughout this area, throughout the country, throughout the world. So keep up your great work. Okay, you too, Jim and Joy. Thank you. Thank you. You can go to BobLujano.com. That's B-O-B-L-U-J-A-N-O.com. You can get a story there, teachings, the book, BobLujano.com. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you're an important part of the family, and we would love to have you join us live right here on At Home. You could meet Father. You could meet our guest. You could have met Bob today. All you need to do is contact us at the Pilgrimage Department, and you could do that by emailing pilgrimages at EWTN.com, or you can give them a jingle, 205 271-2966 and make your way to beautiful Irondale, Alabama. Some people come bringing their um, parents or they're coming as family, especially during the summertime. It's just absolutely beautiful and it's a great place to come and especially go up to the shrine. Well, right now we're going to go straight to Rome and we're going to hear from Joan. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, hello once again from stupendous Rome, and greetings to all of you at home. And today's another edition of Did You Know That? And a lot of people have written to ask me about papal orders, chivalric orders, equest equestrian orders. Now, a lot has been written about them, so I'm just going to have to give you the, the nutshell version today. Papal orders are those honors given by a pope as head of the Catholic Church, as head of Vatican City, to people. And there are actually five of these papal honors. Normally, they, for many years, they were consigned by a bull signed by the pope. The orders were kind of reformed in the 20th century. Now they are signed by the Secretary of State, and the diploma is given to the awardee. Now, there are five papal orders. The highest and most rarely given is called the Supreme Order of Christ. The second is also rarely given. It is called the Order of the Golden Spur. The third order is that of Pius IX, also called Piano Ordine. The fourth order is that of St. Gregory the Great. And the fifth order, I have to say I know well, it is the Order of St. Sylvester, Pope and Martyr. Pope Benedict made me a dame of this order in 2005, and this was only nine years after Pope John Paul opened the order to women. Now, those are the papal orders, but then there's also the equestrian orders, the chivalric orders. You've all heard of the Knights of Malta, and the Knights of Malta, by the way, this is an organization under the protection of the Pope, not a papal honor. It's also an independent state, has relations with other sovereign states. And then the second order or chivalric order protected by the Pope is the order, the equestrian order of the Holy Sepulchre. The head of this order is an American Cardinal. They're always named by the Pope. And that order is, that head of that order is Cardinal Edwin O'Brien. Both of these, by the way, were founded about the same time. Malta about 1048 and the Holy Sepulchre about 1099, the start of the First Crusade. So that's it for orders, but back to you at home. Thanks so much, Joan. Boy, a lot of facts there, a lot of history there. Yes. So how are you doing, Father? It's great to have you again and very powerful, meaningful, hopeful time. Yes, you know, Show. when we have this picture here of Bob with uh, St. John Paul II, I couldn't help but think of back to 1987 when EWTN was going to go 24 hours a day, Mother Angelica said, mm -hmm. and we're going to cover Pope John Paul II's visit to the United okay. States. Mm -hmm. And you may remember one of the last stops he made was to Los Angeles. And it was there he's ta talking to young people, and Tony Melendez was playing the guitar. Mm, that's and the Pope right. was so moved, that. he jumped off the stage, yes, went over and hugged so Tony. Mm. And then he hopped back up on the stage mm -hmm. and he said, Tony, you give us all hope. Yeah. Right. And that's what I was thinking today as we were yeah. watching Bob. Mm -hmm. Bob, you give us all hope. Mm -hmm. And I asked Bob, I said, yes. well, I, I was assuming that that was planned, the encounter with the Holy Father. Mm -hmm. You know, he's sitting, he says, no, it was not planned. Wow. That he spotted him 
and came down. Mm -hmm. And uh, he encountered him face to face and he just welled up with tears as he told me about that, that encounter. He really, the Holy Father in a lot of ways was uh, uh, the Pope of promoting the sacredness and dignity of every human mm -hmm. being in the womb, outside of the womb, every situation yes. and just the dignity of the human person and to encounter him face to face that closely yes. to be singled out in that way must have been a moment. Mm. I was thinking too as Bob said he visits the elderly and so on that when you meet a person with those kind of difficulties you know they have compassion. Right. You're going to have a listening ear mm -hmm. that has compassion for your own struggles and yeah. troubles because they've had to overcome difficulties in their life and they have hope in the Lord and they have, they continue to go forward. Yeah. Right. We're really living in a cultural time, the culture of death, the throwaway culture. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why live this way? Why even live with suffering? And this is just, just growing mm -hmm. and, and just growing more and more ferocious. And yet we have the gospel of life. We have the Catholic Church standing right. up at this time. Um, speak about that, that, that conflict that yeah. that battle and uh, you know it can be very overwhelming and daunting or I guess we can look at it like Bob looks at his life like let's let's crusade for this Let, let's put mm -hmm. this forth right well you think of mother Angelica who recently passed away the last years of her life were spent in bed mm -hmm. what is she doing right. is she mm -hmm. accomplishing anything right. Well, people wanted to be with her. They wanted to be in her room. Mm -hmm. Doctors, right. nurses, mm -hmm. retired people, because there was something happening mm -hmm. there. There was, some, there was still, her heart was united to God. And there was something powerful. There was something that was bearing fruit in that life, even though she couldn't move a limb, really without help and assistance. There was something beautiful going on there because she was un united to God. And that's, that's the case of uh, any human person, mm -hmm. right? Whatever right. our struggles are, whatever our hardships are, that when we're united to, to God, Pope John Paul said, in suffering there's always a spark of redemption. Mm -hmm. that God's doing something right. in that. Right. right. And you just can't see it, you don't know it. Like mm -hmm. Bob, when he was a little boy and he contacted this, you know, meningitis and they had to amputate arms, mm -hmm. legs. You, you're thinking, oh, I should just crawl into a big black hole and, and say mm -hmm. it's over, you know. Yeah. But how instrumental his father was yeah. in his life That's too. Great. You know, that he was making, you know, it was like, okay, so let's go. You know, this is it when we're going to do things, right. you know. And when, I mean, you just see the little boy when he's in the gym class and they want him to play chess, but he wants to throw the football, <laughs> right. you know, because he's still a little boy, right. you know, and he, he wants to play and he wants to be a part. And that's something that we, we all have disabilities. Some are seen and mm -hmm. some are not seen, right. but we're all disabled. Mm -hmm. And the church is a hospital for all of us. Yeah, that, the, the point about his father, and I'm sure his father's probably not perfect like all fathers, but, mm -hmm. you know, he had that affirmation the essence of his being. I mean, he yes. was helped to make him solid. He was firm in himself as, as a person. And then he speaks about, you know, John Paul, you know, yeah. the father, the papa of all papas that comes down and, and looks, you know, at him just, just a moment. And I asked him about it. He just kind of teared up and just, I'll never, I'll never forget that moment. Yeah. But, but the power, and you as a father, you know, yeah. you, your sins are forgiven, you know, mm -hmm. and affirming. Speak about that, the, the importance of we're facing things, but we do need other people mm -hmm. to come into our lives mm -hmm. and tell us who we are, to pull that out of us and to say, this is who you are, yeah. and, and to kiss this and say, be stable in here. You know, it reminded me of what Sister Michael said. I read this at the funeral, something Sister Michael said, that right. Mother said, no pity parties, mm -hmm. okay? Something happens, right. you know, something that uh, discourages you, you, well, you go down a different avenue. Mm -hmm. You do something different. Right. But you don't just give up. Right. There's just another avenue that you need to go. Mm -hmm. And I think love sees a potential in the person. Yeah. Okay, maybe you've had this setback, you've had this tragedy. Mm -hmm. It's not the end. Mm -hmm. There's another avenue that you need to go. There's some other work than maybe that you had planned. You know, yeah. a lot of us, I never planned that I was going to be in front of the TV camera, right. but, and yet God... You were an puts, engineer minding your own business. <laughs> I was behind it, right. you know? But God moves yeah. us there. Mm -hmm. He puts us there and we say, okay, Lord, I'll do the best that I can. Mm -hmm. The other thing he does to us is that, you know, I feel like he's come to me a number of times and said, I know what you can do mm -hmm. 
but let me show you what I can do. So that's the thing, I'm behind the camera, now you're gonna be in front of the camera. Right. I can't do that, that's right where I want you, because I have dependent. to. Mm -hmm. it's dependent. Relying on him, as his mother said, her suffering kept, him de kept her dependent right. on him. Mm -hmm. So she knew her place, it kept her humble, mm -hmm. it kept her calling upon him. And it keeps us broken. You know, because we as Americans, you know, you could get so self-reliant, you know, like, look at what I can do. But it, mm -hmm. it isn't. You know, it's what God wants to do through you, right. even with your gifts and your talents that he's given to you. And, you know, I think Bob was just so beautiful. And the way that he articulated that and shared that, especially even about his, his grandmother. And, you know, everybody's influence of shaping and molding all of us in our mm -hmm. lives, how we do, you know. Yeah. Well, it's all part of it. <clears throat> Why don't you give us a, a blessing and help to strengthen the people as we face all sorts of challenges, but to know in all things we can do it in Christ. Amen. Father, again, we thank you for the gift of our lives and the gift of the crosses and struggles in our lives which keep us looking to you for light and strength and help in our time of need, knowing that we can rely upon you that we can trust in your promises, that hope is always alive in our heart because you have destined us for glory. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for being an important part of this family. We love you, we bless you, and all of your loved ones. Bye now, but keep it on EWTN.